It's a good looking group. You have to look so scared. Aw, oh, brotherly help. You guys can sit right here next to me. Where are you going? <coughs> no, you want to sit there. Okay. Hi. How are you? Good. You all right, Matthew? That's all right. <laughs> those are. I like those flowers on there. Those are really cool. Have any of you ever been sick? Have you been sick? You've been sick before? What happens when you have a cold, when you, when you feel sick? Do you, do you cough? You cough, don't you? You sneeze sometimes? No? Nothing? Quiet? <laughs> nothing? Well, I'll tell you what happens when I get sick. When I get sick, I sneeze and I cough and I make all sorts of noise and I keep Kristen awake because I snore like a freight train and it's terrible. When you're in school, or when you're around your friends, or even just with your family, when you have to sneeze, what do you have? What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to go. Bah! No. What are you supposed to do? You, that's right. You sneeze into your elbow. You become a sneezing vampire. Now, why would you do that? Why would you sneeze into your elbow? Do you have any idea? Do you just do it because you're told? That's, uh-huh. Uh, that's a good place to do it, too, is in a tissue. That's right. Well, we do that so that when we sneeze, we don't sneeze all over Stephen or Chris. We sneeze in our elbow. We don't spread those nasty germs to other people. It's a really big word. It's called being contagious. We don't want it to go anywhere. We don't want anyone else to get sick. We just want to keep it right there. Or right here. That's all we want to do. We don't want to spread it with anybody else. That's not good. Because we don't want anyone else to get sick. We want to, we want to become better, not make other people feel bad. But you know what? That's kind of a negative thing to think about. Sometimes other things that can be contagious or spread aren't things... Oh, that's perfect. I'm glad you... I have them there too. There are other things, though, that, are, that we spread to other people that aren't necessarily bad. Like yawning. You ever thought about that? When you yawn, everyone else has yawned. Who just yawned? Somebody did. Someone thought about it. Jackie Doll did. I saw her. She looked down. <laughs> laughing. Laughing is also contagious. There have been studies done by people who are really, really smart who said that when you do things like laughing, other people will laugh, whether because they feel awkward or because it's just what they do. There are a lot of things in our life that are contagious. Well, in our stories today... Oh, please tell me something. Yep. So I oh, man, I'm glad you have a good memory. That's wonderful. That is wonderful. Well, we're going to talk about our text today, because in our text today, some things that happen are as the disciples, they're going to catch something. Just like we talked about catching a cold or getting, catching laughter because other people are laughing or yawning and catching a yawn, the disciples are going to catch something. And the thing they're going to catch today that will carry them for the rest of our life and carries us in the rest of our lives is the Holy Spirit. I'm wearing red today. Stephen will be putting on a red stole today. Oh, I'm sorry. Because today is the day, Sunday, of Pentecost. It's the day that the Spirit of God comes down to God's people that are the disciples of Jesus. They're in a room together. Jesus said, I want you to come together. I want you to pray. I want you to be together because I'm going to give you something. You're going to catch the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes into them and it gives them the ability to go out to talk about their faith, to talk about what they're doing in life, to not just stay in their homes, not stay in the behind closed doors, but to be filled with joy and excitement and energy to go out and share all the things that they saw Jesus do while he was here. And one of the greatest things that they're going to share is Jesus' love. Because not only did Jesus die for our sins, he was resurrected. He came back to life just for us. And they're going to catch that spirit, just like sometimes we catch colds. And they're going to go out and they're going to spread that. Because that's something we want to spread. We want to tell other people about Jesus. We want to tell other people about his love. About all the wonderful things that he's done in our lives and has promised to do in our lives. Have a seat. So today, on this Pentecost Sunday, when we think about the red, 
When we see the dove on top of the big banner that's up there, the dove coming down, the big dove that's over there that's flying, that's on the wall, those big, beautiful banners, it's the symbol of the Spirit, God's Spirit coming down to us so that we can go out and tell other people about Jesus. Let's pray. Will you fold your hands and pray with me? Repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for Jesus who taught the disciples and us how to catch your Holy Spirit so that we can share your love with others. Amen. You can have a seat. You can go back to your seats. A reading from Acts, the second chapter, beginning at the first verse. When the day of Pentecost had come, the apostles were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them, as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at the sound, and at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Cretans and Arabs in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, 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 and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show port portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day, then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. We will now read Psalm 104 responsively. How manifold are your works, O Lord! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There go the ships to and fro, and Leviathan, which you made for the sport of. You give it to them, they gather it. You open your hand, and they are filled with good things. You send forth your spirit, and they are created, and so you renew the face of the earth. You look at the earth and it trembles. You touch the mountains and they smoke. May these words of mine please God. I will, re I will rejoice in the Lord. A reading from 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, beginning at the third verse. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of services, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. 
To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits. To another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though one, many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one Spirit we are we're all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. The word of the Lord. I invite you to rise as you're able as we sing our gospel acclamation, page 198. Holy Gospel according to John, the 20th chapter. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them, and he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Don't fall asleep yet, Chris. The sermon hasn't started yet. Good job, Mr. Bradley, on those names. Man, that's second only to the opening chapter of Matthew's Gospel, the genealogies. Very good. You just read them fast enough and everyone's like, that's how you say that. All right. And for those of you that are Pirates of Caribbean fans, the Leviathan in your psalm, that's where the Kraken comes from. That's the, the theory behind the Kraken. So there you go. Little did you know you'd have Jeopardy in this as well. What is the Leviathan? There you go. Internationally renowned scholar, pastor, and author, Barbara Brown Taylor, whose books I highly recommend if you have any free space on your side table for them, rattled the sanctuary on our final day at the Festival of Homiletics with this statement. She said to a group of 2,000 pastors, we don't keep the spirit in the back because she is shy. We do so because she is dangerous. She was addressing the role as we as mainline denominations attribute to the third person of the Trinity and how we have degraded that role because we fear what God is up to through the Spirit. Even though in our own heritage Martin Luther greatly enjoyed what God can do through the Spirit and even challenged the church through writing to attentively watch for what was going to happen next, while we as the church of the here and now have become much more afraid. We have relegated the Spirit's works in our lives to something close to a sneeze. It comes occasionally, often without warning, but in all actuality, it doesn't mean much or change much of anything. Unless you happen to be like me or my grandfather and you can restart your own heart with a sneeze, then perhaps you might need a tissue. Thank you, Glenda. I thought that was funny too. Ah, pity laugh, pity laugh. The Holy Spirit in our day and time is merely something we confess about in our creeds, we occasionally pray for in our prayers of intercession, but we really don't do much with this person. 
We seem to leave everything to our Baptist and Pentecostal sisters and brothers. So why don't we just name it as Lutherans? We fear what God is up to through the Holy Spirit. Because more often than not, the Spirit causes us to question our formally assumed beliefs and come to experience the wholeness and grace-filled openness of God's kingdom in a new way. The Spirit is something we cannot control nor something we can fully prepare for. When it comes to the doctrines of the church or, the, or our scriptures, we can redirect and reattribute things we believe as misinterpretations of scripture and then seek to point to other verses or other writings for clarification. Normally we would say things like, well, if you would just read further in John's gospel, or, well, why don't you go back and reread what Luther said? Or go back and see what God is doing in the Old Testament. We are seeking to not only find places for our beliefs to fit in, for our interpretations to make sense, but we are doing the best to draw other people to our side of the sandbox. But when it comes to the movement of the Spirit, things are less encased in leather-bound backs and ink-covered pages. The third person of the Trinity tends to work in ways that defy the normality of life and draws us closer to the encounter of the divine in ways that don't always fit into boxes. It's the time in life when you as a NASA rocket scientist come home to your family and say, I believe God is calling me to be a pastor and we should move to Dubuque, Iowa and go to Wartburg Theological Seminary. His name is Pastor Harold Vanacek, and he serves St. Peter's Lutheran Church in Marble Falls. It's when the leading World Health Organization's AIDS Prevention Initiative physician comes to his family living on the island of Madagascar and says, I believe God is calling me to serve the church in a new way. I believe that I should be a pastor. The Reverend Dr. Mami Ramasavarian classmate of mine. It's the time when you are sitting in a place that holds a great deal of memory for you, or a place that is beyond special to your life's journey, and you are completely alone. Yet you know and you feel as if someone is there with you in prayer. It's when you enter the darkest part of your life and there seems to be no hope of light ever returning and you say to yourself, I thought you said darkness couldn't overcome light, Jesus. And in that moment of pain and frustration, the phone rings. It's your best friend who says, something told me to call you. What's going on? Or when you have said goodbye to the ones you have held most dear and commended them to the arms of Almighty God and our Lord and Savior, and yet still, in the quietness and solitude of worry, as you wonder about what is going to happen next, you hear that still, small voice, I love you, just as if they were still there. Or in that moment in your life when a speech, a sermon, a testimony, or someone's witness draws from within you a passion you never thought you had, nor a, or a voice you never knew existed from within you, and you begin to realize, I have a dream too. That is what the spirit active in our lives can begin to look like. Obviously, it's not an exhaustive list, but merely the tip of a massive spiritual iceberg. And that is why it is so difficult to hear these things and embrace these things. They are as varied as you and I are varied. They are as unique to us as our own fingerprints, yet as vital to our Christians in our Christian journey as much as the air we breathe. So why, do you ask? Because if we don't share these experiences and give voice to the ways in which God through the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, encounters us, and guides us, 
we will never fully embrace and see all that God is up to. We will lift our head from the pillow and return it each night, thinking that God is only active in some people's lives and not my own because, well, God didn't do that for me. When in all actuality, God is always there. The Spirit is always there, actively doing amazing things in our lives. But because we have categorically said that God can only act in this way or that way, we have missed the forest because of the trees. Instead, when we, when we tell our story and invite others to tell their stories, we mutually become beneficiaries of God's expansive, redeeming, and grace-filled kingdom. I will promise you that some of the stories you will hear will be hard to hear because they are reflective of a world, culture, and society we hope and pray doesn't exist anymore, but it most certainly does for many. But as Pastor Barbara Brown Taylor ended her lecture to our group, Blessed.